every great oboist knows that the key to the most expressive and dynamic playing starts with a great blank. This week's burning reed making topic, and this time I really mean burning, is among other things to explore the method of burning the shaped cane onto the staple. In preparation for the upcoming live and interactive Zoom Read Room sessions, I interview David Werner, author of the book, Der Weg zum Guten Oboenrohr, now also available in English under the title, The Way to a Good Oboe Read. David is this week's Oboe Read Master, and later this week, he will join the dynamic read makers in the Zoom Read Room to guide us in wetting our shaped cane to our staples. I'm Janine Krause from JK Double Readmaking and your host for the Oboe Readmaster series. I want you to hang out with the world's best readmaking experts and find out how they solve burning read issues. So follow the link to stay in the loop. David is currently principal oboist at the Anheitisches Theater in Dessau. In addition to regular solo and chamber music concerts, he is increasingly devoting himself to writing. If you haven't already, be sure to check out his German language blog, www.obo-blog.de. It isn't just a blog, it's an experience. Aesthetically pleasing and well thought out, he informs oboists about new developments and products related to the oboe. Welcome, David. So normally at this time you would be playing in the orchestra. What are you doing instead and where are you? In, instead of playing in the orchestra at the moment because of Corona, um, I'm building a lot on my own house in Dessau. And uh, we are now in and now I can uh, look for my oboe again and play, playing again the oboe and building reeds. So it makes fun again and yeah, now I can start. Well, congratulations on the new home. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So when you pick up your oboe again and start playing, um, and in general, what is more important to you? Is it how you feel when you play or how you sound? I think the sound, but um, when it's too hard and only dark, um, the sound is good. But when I can't play the things I want to play, then I can't use the read. So I think priorities, it's a little bit difficult to say. Um, I think the both is, is maybe the, the best way. It's the way in between. Uh, the small point in between, between the big, uh, the great full sound and the, uh, that I can play everything I want, that I can play piano, that I can play warm. But I, yes, I think the, the way in between. Do these priorities shift at all based on the repertoire you're playing, where you are, or the size of the ensemble? Yes, of course, it um, shifts a lot. When I play an orchestra, I need a um, full with a, with a big sound because um, I have to play over 15, 20 strings. Uh, I have to play in a very huge concert hall. Uh, and when I play I can chamber music, uh, there's maybe only one string or one, one clarinet I play, I play together. And I have to play on a very flexible reed. I have to play on a very, yeah, very uh, easy reed because I have to play uh, more, more notes, longer phrases. Uh, I need a very easy reed. And when I play solo, I have to play a very, very easy reed because uh, have to yeah, maybe the Strauss concept is very uh, hard to play, and then when I have when I play a Strauss concert with a uh, with a reed which I play in in the orchestra, I maybe I can do the first phrase, and after that I I can't play anymore. I think that's why we need different for every situation. What's the very first thing that comes to mind if I say reed making? It's the important thing of playing the oboe, I think. All the thoughts are going around read, read making, read building. I think for every professional oboe. 
because it's the main thing. <laughs> because when the week work, we have a problem when we have to play the concert in the evening. Just an interesting aside, I did a survey of 600 reed makers. They self-identified as professional, semi-professional, amateur hobbyists. And um, the response in their needs and their desires and what they felt like they wanted to be better at, mm -hmm. there was no difference in okay. the responses. I, I think an amateur, you need a very, very, maybe sometimes a better read than a professional. Uh, David, explain your read making philosophy and has it changed over the years? Yes. Um, in the beginning, when I, when I was a student and I began to build marines, I want to have reads that I, that sounds good, that play perfect, that everything is fine. I have to uh, look very detailed of it. And when you're later in, in an orchestra, uh, you don't have the time because every evening you have concerts and or playing an opera, and then you have to play on reads that are not perfect, uh, but that works. And that, that has changed um, very early when you get, get in the orchestra or get in the professional concerts and uh, doing a lot of this. Um, yeah. So my philosophy is that now not build perfect reads, but build reads that work that work at first. That's the first point. The read has to do all the things you want to do. And after that, you can uh, look if the sound is perfect. It's a different rent when I have a solo concert or a very, um, a very uh, big chamber music stuff like this. Then I have to look more on the sound um, because um, everybody sees me more and I have to play more uh, things of that. But the first thing I think is the read have to do what I want. And that has changed to me. Uh, when I was a student, uh, I only want to read that are perfect and always sound good and always dark full. And that, uh, yeah, no, that's an, an, uh, another philosophy. What do you enjoy about read making? Uh, that I don't have to practice at uh, this point um, because I can maybe uh, drink a cup of tea or TV is on and making reads and yes, tying on the reads. Um, so I don't have to practice at this moment and doing something for my job. So <laughs> I think that's, uh, yeah, that's very cool. <laughs> Not always to have to practice like maybe a violin player, because when he do something for his job, he only can practice, and practice and practice and practice, and we can read. read. <laughs> what is the least enjoyable part of read making for you? The least enjoying part. I don't know, sorry. <laughs> Have you taught read making? And if so, what's the biggest mistake that your students make when they're making their own reads? The main problem is to scraping read, uh, to, um, to move the knife in the right way. I think that's very difficult to the beginners. After that, uh, um, then the main problem is that you change the parameters too soon, uh, yeah, too soon, um, or change the, a lot of parameters at the same time. I think at first you have to maybe cop, uh, copy uh, copy um, the read building method of your teacher, and then after that you can change uh, to make it perfect to your to your own, uh, but. Don't change everything at the same time. Don't change the facon, uh, the length, and uh, the staple at the same time. No, only change the staple, build 15, 20 reads, and try it. If it's, uh, yeah, what, what changes um, comes. And that's the main problem, not 
to all the changes at the same time, I think. What really has to be in place as you're making a read? Um, mm -hmm. Did I explain the idea of a read truth, or have you have you heard me talk about this before? Maybe if you've seen any other stuff. Mm -hmm. I think the main thing is the precise, uh, maybe hogeln, um, the English word is? Gouging. Gouging, yes, gouging. Uh, the precise gouging, maybe, uh, because there are, I think, not different ways. I think there is only a right way. I'm not talking to, to gouging wet or dry, but there's a way you can do it or you do it wrong. I think such things are read through. Uh, when we come to tying on or burning or scraping, there are a lot of ways you can do and everything works. But on gouging, um, I think there are not so many ways. I think there are a lot of truth if you do it right or if you do it wrong. Very interesting. I'll be curious to hear more about that. So what are your most important tools? And for example, maybe your favorite knife or? Um, I have only one knife for scraping. And this knife, my oboe teacher uh, gave it to me when I was maybe 16 years old. And I have this knife till now. I'm now 34. So I think, it, uh, you don't need a very special knife. I don't, I think you need a knife that works for you uh, and that is sharp. And I sharpened it on my own on a wet Chinese uh, in Japan, I think Japan uh, stone, red stone, and I think it works fine for me. And Do you have any good remaking stories, some grand successes or bitter failures? Yes, I think a um, very interesting story is how I learned to, to build reeds. Uh, when I started the studies on Hamburg High School, uh, my professor Paulus van der Merwe said to me, okay, the first semester you can play on uh, reels you write, and, but in the second semester you have to look that you only play on your own reeds. And after that, I went home I put all my built reeds in a case, uh, put it away, and from this point I play on my own reeds. I never played on a built reed again. So I think for a lot of oboes, it could work very well when you force you that you have to play on your own reeds. I, I often see, yes, I have some built uh, by reeds, maybe when I don't uh, have a re good read, I can take this and you have the problem that you maybe not come to that point that you are uh, independent. You always have the thought like oh, maybe I can buy one or two reads. So maybe I think put them away and try your own. I think it will work. So David, what is your read making superpower? Superpower, okay, superpower. I think my special tip, uh, my special uh, thing is a little bit the, the burning on the mandrel, uh, which I want to show you how, how I do it and uh, what other uh, positive things about that. I don't want to say that's my superpower, but uh, well, to say that a special thing that I can show you and uh, that are often not in the mind of uh, so much over this, just to forgot. So. so how important for your performing and playing career it, are your skills in read making? I think it's, it's very important because when you can't uh, build good reads, um, it's very difficult to, to play very, very good oboe. Um, there are a lot of oboists which uh, play on bite reads very, very good. But then you have to um, 
lay another way because you can't um, do the reads for you. Then you have to learn how you can play on every read what you get on your way. Because the sound on when you when you get a uh, when you buy a read is always another way a little bit. And then you have to change your brusher maybe to a way that you can produce your sound on every other read you, you got. And when you build reads, you have the opportunity to produce. Uh, a special read what's perfectly fit to you. I think that is uh, uh, the success which um, an oboe player can get. So we have the opportunity, every other um, instrument can't do this. We have the opportunity to produce uh, reads for us that are perfectly only for us. That's the opportunity, I think. So tell me a little bit about why you wrote the way to the good read. I want to get something for me which um, brings me brings me a lot and um, yes, and I um, I had the feeling that a lot of students only copy the building read method um, of their teacher. And then after that, they have problems and don't know why, because the read work on my professor, he plays very good and is a um, super oboist and why I can't play on that read. And I want to give the students uh, oppor um, the yeah, opportunity to, to look what's, what are be what's behind. Because in the past, there are a lot of secrets and somebody don't tell her what, yeah, what's the secret of building reads. Marvelous. It's been such a pleasure to get this chance to talk to you, David. We look very much forward to being able to work with you for these two sessions and perhaps many more in the future. Yes, I'm looking forward to it.